Thank you very much, Wim, and thank you very much for the, for the, the invitation. I've been looking forward to this event, and um, I would like to begin with a little um, nugget of Sir John Templeton, how little we know, how eager to explore uh, connoisseurs will know that is really how eager to learn, but I thought that explore is not foreign to the spirit that he had. Actually, in the uh, science reading discussion so far, there has always there has been talk about models and metaphors and paradigms. And um, Ian Barber spoke about models as imaginative tools for ordering experience in this book. He also talked about models in science as imagined, an imagined mechanism postulated by analogy with familiar mechanisms and processes and used to construct a theory to correlate a set of observations. However, it's just, it has been, it's only more recently that thought experiment have come to the center of, of attention in the philosophy of science. And I also want to acknowledge particularly the work of Giftach Fihige, who has written several important articles, one in, in one of the last issues of, uh, of Saigon on actually on thought experiments in the work of John Polkinghorne. And maybe it's not a coincidence that, uh, that a leading science written scholar who comes from, from quantum mechanics is the one who has actually promoted the idea of playing with the toys of thought uh, the most as uh, John has done. Actually, the concept it, it itself, here I may raise a Danish flag, comes from Hans Christian Oerster, the discovery of the electromagnetic effect in 1811 and in German in 1820. And then it was later taken up by uh, Ernst Mach, uh, who looks very stern here. Uh, Ernst Mach thought that thought experiments were actually only a sort of a, of a, of a forecourt to the holy grail of the crucial experiments, but still he also talk about the mental development that thought experiments could provide. What is then a thought experiment? I have seen no definitions of this in the literature, and here I provide some general characterizations. I think first of all that a thought experiment must be economic in shape and relevant for, for the problem in question like models in science. They also combine visual imaginations with, narrative, with a narrative plot like stories. They also, and this is what I'm going to emphasize and which I do not always find emphasized that much, is that it combines common sense intuitions with counterfactual and conditional reasonings, giving this and that. What happens if, if this and that happens uh, given what we would presume? So it's like stretching common sense. And I think that the, the idea that common sense is behind also explains why thought experiments continue to be with us. Because you, uh, you can understand them as a lay person without having the, the, the special equipment of being an experimental physicist or the like. And also that they feed into stories and narratives that you actually can retell. Yet they have specific argumentative targets, unlike uh, fancy and fiction. And I think another uh, uh, characteristic which has not been very much spoken of in the literature is that there are no clear distinction between uh, explanance and explanandum. Uh, some would challenge it, this, this point, I think. But I would argue that they show rather than argue. And it's by showing it that their, that their persuasiveness comes through. And I put it the way that a thought experiment is, is hypothetical because it has to do with conditionals and counterfactuals. But it's not like a hypothesis or a theory. It has another status, so to speak. For a thought experiment creates a world of its own. In order to explicate implicit knowledge, which is often the case in philosophy, or in order to explore new contingent features of reality, as is often the case in the sciences. So there are different types of thought experiments that are often routinely discussed, critical, positive, both critical and positive. I don't have the time to go into the cases. Some of you will know them. 
There are also apologetic uh, thought experiments saying like when uh, uh, when a Christian or other theists say, well, the world is as we would expect it to be if there were a God. Or like Dawkins says, well, the evolution of the world of biology is exactly as we would expect it to be if there was no God. So it's a difficult thing to have these grand scale thought experiments, but, uh, but still, I think we cannot avoid them. What I want to emphasize is the, the function of thought models as explorative. They can be heuristic for specific experiments, but they can also be explorative in a more general sense, also without being able to be transformed into a real world experience, uh, experiment. Thomas Kuhn was actually one of the few to take up the notion again in 1964, saying that granting that every successful thought experiment embodies in its design some prior information, what I called common sense, about the world. That information is not itself at issue in the experiments. How then, relying exclusively on familiar data, can a thought experiment lead us to new knowledge or to a new understanding of nature? That is, in a sense, the, the uh, kind of, of, of paradox. Well, some argue that they actually don't give us any new uh, information, that, that thought experiments are, are just uh, arguments, uh, coached as stories, so that uh, they actually have no specific value of their own. This is a very empiricist view. So it's a sort of a dress, uh, dress uh, rehearsal or, or dressed up argument, as in John D. Norton. The problem with this view, however, is that many thoughts uh, experiments can have different interpretations. Think of the clock in the box uh, thought experiment by, by uh, Einstein from 1930, where he, he thought about a clock uh, which actually within a box, which actually made sure that there was an emission of one photon at a time every minute or every second. Then this box should be, should be uh, lighter, less heavy than earlier. And uh, Bohr was actually devastated by this uh, thought experiment that came up in 1930. And then he came home and rethought the argument, saying, well, you still have to measure this. So you have to take into account the whole measurement situation. So his, his thought experiment wouldn't work. And it also goes with other, other uh, thought experiments, like uh, the one about the future ne neurologist Mary who is colorblind uh, but knows everything about the brain, will she know anything new about reality? No, said uh, Frank Jackson. I will come back to this, this if I have time. Uh, but Daniel Dennell said, well, she would just say, oh, that's always what I thought that colors would be if she were, were remedied by, from her, from her uh, uh, color disease or, or lack of, of color perception. In the opposite end, we have a more Platonist approach uh, by Jan James Robert Brown at uh, Toronto University, uh, where also uh, Yiftach uh, Fege lives. Uh, and he argues that TEs are like telescopes into abstract domains of reality. And uh, the, is maybe able sometimes in lucky cases to, to, um, to uncover uh, laws of nature that uh, by simply by contemplating mathematical proportions and so on. He calls this a platonic view, and I think he should not have done that because, of course, nobody wants to be Platonist in that sense, and James uh, or Jim uh, Brown is not either because he has a very fallible view of that. So, in, a, in, in effect, the, the so-called einstein podolsky rosen dilemma I think from 38, was aimed to show the absurdity of Niels Bohr's view and the putative ex existence of local hidden variables. And it turned out when, when it was later put into experiment by Alan Aspect in, in, uh, in 1983, I think, that, uh, that actually there were, were global, uh, 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 global variables uh, uh, or, or global coordinations, but no local hidden variables. So the point is, I think, that we have to admit uh, against Brown that, that thought experiments are, are contrived. They are set up. They are imagined. 
And I think we have to admit that. And in a sense, going with a Kuhnian view in this, in, in this case, I don't think you should be Kuhnian all over, but I think concerning thought experiments, it is not a bad thing. And one of those who, 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 uh, who is following Kuhn is Tama Sabo Gentler, uh, who speaks about thought experiments as, as, uh, as um, invoking uh, mental scenarios that actually evoke belief in new realities. She didn't say that it evokes an insight, direct insight into new reality, but our beliefs about what could be out there is heavily informed by thought experiments. So uh, that is what you see here. It may even bring us to new beliefs about Few, uh, uh, contingent futures of the natural world, and these are produced not inferentially, as Norton would have it, but quasi-observationally. So in a sense, she follows uh, Brown's general understanding, but without this very heavy Platonist uh, underpinning of it, and I think that she is right in this respect. I do not say that thought experiments could not reveal uh, uh, abstract uh, things, but like in mathematical intuition, and I just think that you cannot define a concept or uh, 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 by uh, such exceptional cases. So let me take some philosophical thought experiments. Robert Nozick's uh, uh, experience machine from 1974. Imagine a future neuropsychologist constructing a machine capable of stimulating via electrodes your brain in such detail that you would always experience a full satisfaction of your innermost desires. Within the machine, in this virtual world, you would experience bliss, be it love, beauty, academic accomplishments, whatever, exactly as you wish. However, it would just be, it would just be an, uh, an, an a subjective experience. No real world out there, no beloved ones out there, no real problem solved. And if you enter, enter the machine, your brain will forever be changed. You cannot go back and live the normal life. Would you plug in? Would you plug in? That's like making me like a golem uh, idea uh, 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 reconceived. And his argument, Nozick, is uh, that uh, we really want to be self-involved human agents. We wanted to, to have transactions with the real world. Oh, what happened here? No, 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 what happened here? So, okay. So, and um, <clears throat> I would argue that he actually does not give us uh, knowledge about new contingent physical features of the world, as Gendler argued, but she, he actually, I think, uncovered a dimension of reality which is inescapably linked with human existence. So take a gentle uh, personhood away, an embodiment away, and you take humanity uh, away. So that's like uncovering some implicit knowledge that we often take for granted, and a thought experiment can reveal us this, the importance of this dimension to us again. So also with John Searle's Chinese room uh, 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 um, example, you know it, you get in a little piece of paper in, in Chinese, you don't understand Chinese, and then you just have a, a recipe for where to hand it on, but have you understood anything? No, you have not. So that means take semantics away and you take language away. You cannot stay with the syntactics uh, of language. That's why you cannot say that a computer can think. And something similar is with Frank Jackson's knowledge argument about Mary, the, the psychologist. Would she learn something new about the world by, by seeing the colors that she, she knew all all the, the, the causal roots in the, in the brain uh, uh, causally responsible for the, for the color vision, but she did not have any color vision herself. Would she learn anything new? Well, actually, Jackson says, yes, she would. She never saw the colors before. So some general le lessons from uh, philosophical thought experiments, I think that they usually aim to explicate dimensions of reality without which the world would not be as it actually is. It both presupposes and challenges our immediate common sense conceptions of reality, while uncovering underlying and hidden aspects of ordinary existence. And in that sense, it is critical in order to be positive or revealing. I just want to show that we can, f we can find such, uh, such uh, thought experiments also in tradition. 
he has one from the Taoist tradition. I don't think I have time to go into it. So I will just, uh, for the brave, for the uh, sake of brevity, brevity, I would just take another example, well, more well known to you, when Jesus is saying, if your child asks for a fish, will will you then give a snake instead of a, of, a, of a fish, or so on? Will you give a scorpion if the if the child asks for for an egg, and so on? And so this is sort of a thought, little thought experiment, but it is then actually backed out by, by a consensus uh, 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 beliefs about uh, that God is acting like a father. So you are evil fathers or mothers, but uh, will not then the heavenly father hear what you say. I think that, that Christian theology can be, in a sense, reconstructed as a thought experiment. Here I take the divine experiment of creation in the first uh, sense. There will be some positions in Christian theology that would argue that, that the thought experiment of creation is actually the real world experiment. There is no other thing. It would be a theatro mundi, as uh, Calvin said, uh, or as Aquinas said, providence is nothing but the execution of the eternal divine plan. You can also have a more conditional and constrained view, like in Gregory of Nyssa, God facilitating free human response over time without predetermining the, the details of history. Or you can go for a more conditional risk view of the divine thought experiment, as in John Wesley and also open theism today, that, human, that humans are free to say no to God, while human beings are never in this life left without the promptings of divine grace. So unlike uh, uh, philosophical thought experiments, the theological, sorry, unlike philosophical thought experiments, theological thought experiments presuppose specific consensus conditions. Creation involves the creator as somehow communicative, personal, yet any such condition could be questioned in new thought experiments. And I think you could go through also with incarnation, I will leave that. Uh, for the sake of time, different thought experiments within the doctrine of Christology. You could, have, of course, also do it with eschatology, but I just want to take one example with some tracks in what we talked about yesterday about extraterrestrial intelligence. Imagine first we were alone. What would, would be the perspective? Imagine we were not alone, but other intelligent civilizations are less developed than we are. That's what we like to think. Well, then, Imagine we were not alone, but other intelligent civilizations are more progressed than we are. Some would argue that this is more likely if there is extraterrestrial intelligence because our uh, solar system is rather late. But then again, we could go into even finer details. Now think about that they are more intelligent, but evil. We have many, of course, uh, movies about this. Now think about that they were more intelligent and more virtuous than us. And then think about the last thing if they were more intelligent and virtuous, but had no religion. I think this would constitute a challenge for Christian theology. I'm not saying that it's insurmountable, but I'm just saying that it really would, would change my theology, for example. Either I, have, I would have to give up faith, or I would have to say, well, it is true anyway. And then we are just actually the, the elected uh, 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 intelligent beings. But it would be radical. So it's, this is a future scenario, not an eschatological future, but a future scenario that actually would impact theology. And then my last slide is actually about the relationship between thought experiments and life experience when we are dealing with matters of faith. The big question here is, can theology, Christian theology in my case, but also the, other, the theology of other faith traditions, be re reconceived as an embedded set of thought ex experiments, each thought experiment open, hosting and opening up for new and more specified thought experiments. Imagine there's a God to say something, which, I mean, John Lennon said, imagine there's no God, but imagine there's a God, and then say, imagine we had an, an infinite God, not a, a divine being up there uh, in contrast to the world. Imagine that we had an infinite loving God, an infinite, loving, self-revealing God. Imagine we had a, a world-inhabiting God who is actually present not just in Christ, but in the world of creation. Uh, or we had a world-inclusive God, as in uh, Greek and many other eschatologies about uh, participation in divine life.
So my point will here be that faith, hope, and love may be seen as the crucial life experiments intrinsically related to the theological thought experiments because, in a sense, people will, will go in and out at different levels of these things. You could say, well, I believe in a, in that there is a God, but not that it is a loving God, and so on. So it, this creates a whole bubble of, of, of thought experiments that are actually embedded and can be pursued rationally. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and also thank you for keeping to the time. We have only two sessions this afternoon, but this is a long session with four papers, so uh, some endurance will be needed. I would prefer to do the four papers in a row, and a, a quick one. Well, you were mentioned anyhow. Yeah. Okay. So, so just very quick point. There's one use of all the experiments in science I don't think you mentioned, which is just to test the rational coherent consistency of the proposal. John Paulson on Cambridge. That's really what what Einstein and Bohr were involved in, in their uh, thing. Does it, is the uncertainty principle consistent? Einstein had to get around it, because at the end, Bohr showed that he did it thoroughly. It was always consistent. So that's, that's a particular use to test the, uh, the consistency of a proposition. And that is, this is where the uh, scientific uh, thought experiments take on a sort of meta-scientific uh, uh, element, which is very, uh, or nature, which is very close to, to philosophical thought experiments. But still, they will, they will be testable in, 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 in principle, these questions. Thank you.